The year is 20,000 BC. The time, around two o'clock in the afternoon. A young Paleolithic hunter, whom for the purposes of this tale we shall call Gavin, is returning home after an unsuccessful partridge hunt on the nearby grass plains of Ooga Booga. <laughs> Gavin, weary from his mighty journey, takes a moment to rest beneath an enormous prehistoric fig tree. Surveying the valley below him, he turns his nose upwind in a sow to sow westerly direction to ensure he will not be taken by surprise by any nasty saber-toothed rabbits or woolly armadillos. <laughs> Satisfied that he is relatively free from danger in the immediate future, he absentmindedly reaches down, lifts a fallen fig from the ground, and observes its plump, overripe tumescence. Gavin munches down on its figgy goodness, entirely unaware that with each nonchalant chomp, he is irreversibly shaping the future of all humankind! <laughs> Several hours later, Gavin's wife, Stacy, is awaiting her husband's return. <laughs> she fills the time by flogging the skin of a tapir to make herself a lovely new tablecloth. <laughs> Suddenly, her Cro-Magnon ears prick up and the hair on her nipples stands erect <laughs> as she hears a distant unholy warbling approaching from the east. She bares her teeth and drops to her haunches, frozen between a flight or fight response. The spine-chilling bellowing is getting louder, and she calculates that she has little chance to save her children. Better to make her escape while the heaving monster crushes their tiny skulls with its steaming flanks. <laughs> she glances over her shoulder to estimate the distance to her safety, and all at once the source of the terrifying screeching is upon her! It's Gavin, <laughs> wearing a traffic cone on his head and singing The Gambler by Kenny Rogers. <laughs> Gavin is entirely ill-equipped to grasp the significance of the moment, but in eating that fig, he has just set in motion an unalterable sequence of events. He has just unwittingly discovered the magical alcoholic powers of fermented fruit and inadvertently invented the very first fig martini. Imagine for me now, if you will, my friends, a rapid-fire montage of images <laughs> demonstrating the evolution of man's relationship with alcohol from that prehistoric moment to this very day. I would do it for you myself, but data projectors are a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> Frothing tankards of mead, Greeks stomping grapes, sloshed monks draped in vomit shellacked cassocks, sculling, shooting, spewing, all crashing to a dramatic halt on a close-up of my little purple face. The camera slowly pulling out to reveal me drinking the final drop of my final drink 23 months ago today. I ask you to hold tight the significance of that image in your mind's eye over the course of the next indiscriminate quantity of minutes as I open my brain box and sift through the contents for your intended bewilderment and amusement. Because, ladies and gentlemen, Randy is sober! <laughs> Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! How are we all doing, folks? We all good? Good. Look, my name's on the wall. <laughs> it's pretty specky. Never had my own gobo before. Look at that. It says Randy. It's me. It means you're in the right place, my friends. <laughs> As the rather unambiguous title of this show might suggest, I am no longer on the booze train. I don't drink the booze anymore. No longer honking onto the bevies. <laughs> it's been uh, nearly two years now since I. My collar okay? My collar looks all right, doesn't it? From the back? Looks all right from the back? <laughs> I, um, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't drink the booze anymore, which is, uh, which is interesting in my line of work, because I do go to a lot of festivals, I travel around a lot, and, um, and festivals, you know, they are notorious for a lot of smashing the booze in the face like a champ! <laughs> So uh, I, um, I find it a little bit different now, not, not drinking and doing all these festivals. I was in Adelaide this year. You're all familiar with Adelaide, I assume? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's cool, Adelaide. I like Adelaide, but it's not... I mean, it's a mildly depressing place to be. 
if you're not smashed off your face. You know, I like it. I mean, during the festival at night time, it's just wasted people everywhere. And then during the day, it's just tumbleweeds and pregnant teenagers. <laughs> So I found it a bit challenging being there, particularly because, you know, being, being a festival whore, most of my mates, you know, that's when I get to see them, you know, at festivals, you know, so we all get together and it's always like, yeah, and now that I'm not drinking, I get a lot of, oh, come on, Randy, have a drink, you soft car. Come on, you soft car. Just have one, you soft car. <laughs> I don't know if it helps with that, does it? In my experience, it's usually the excessive use of alcohol that tends to soften one's cock, not the other way around. Can't recall using Jägermeister as a cure for erectile dysfunction. But I'm getting a lot of that. And I was in Adelaide. This is, uh, this is true, this bit. I was in Adelaide. And uh, well, all of it's true. Actually, I don't want to just quantify this bit's true. But this, bit, this bit is particularly true. It's not one of those comedian true stories. No, I was fucking this monkey, right? And uh, a nun walked in carrying a chicken. And the chicken went, I don't know what's going <laughs> So I want to hear that story now. Let's just do that for the next two hours. And then the chicken said, Minko tit. Anyway, sorry. I am. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Anything could happen. <laughs> so I was in a hotel and, uh, and I really wanted to drink. It was like three in the morning and I was just struggling with a bit. So I cracked open the Bible because, you know, what would Jesus do? <laughs> and um, this is true. I cracked open the Bible and try not to drink. First thing I read, first word, first verse, first chapter, no shit. Give wine unto those that be of heavy heart. Oh, come on! <laughs> Not you too. Jesus sitting on a cloud somewhere texting me, come to the pub, you soft cock. <laughs> what would Jesus do? He'd get fucked up. <laughs> me and Peter are doing shots of my blood. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been challenging. You people are very lovely. Who have we got in? Hello there, what's your name? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what? Am I looking at you? My eyeballs aren't real. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> You're eating an apple! <laughs> How did he know that? <laughs> I could sense it. What are you doing down there? <laughs> oh, wow. Don't film me! Get away! No, if you can't see it, there is a woman in the front row losing her fucking shit. I think she's choking! Somebody call the paramedic! Maybe I'll talk to someone more like... It's Rosa. Hello, Rosa. Rosa. Maybe I'll come back to you later. How about you? What's your name? <laughs> Shut up, Rosa! You had your turn! <laughs> You there? Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. You? I'm pretty good, thanks. Oh, that's good. Have you been having a drink this evening? Oh, I can't. You can't? Why not? Underage. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How underage? <laughs> like creepy underage? Or I'm just fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just doing the maths, hang on. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. And, uh, okay, well, but that's, this is going a bit shit because I need someone who drinks! <laughs> you! <laughs> Drinky! <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake, this is amazing. Look, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I was just going to have a chat about honking onto the brewskis. But it doesn't matter, we can leave it. We can leave it there, you know? We can leave it there. Rosa, yeah. you feeling better now? Yeah. You okay? You, you all right to participate? Yeah. Thank you, that's wonderful. Why did you stop drinking, Randy? Oh, good question, Rosa, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I might use that as a springboard, if I may. Thanks. Uh, I quit drinking because I was too good at it, really. Rosa, I was better at it than all of you are, and I thought I'd 
quit while I was ahead. But I found that when I did stop drinking, audience participation, check. I found that <laughs> when I did stop drinking, I, uh, I just suddenly had all this spare time on my hands. You know, time that I would you know, normally spend wrapped around the cool enamel of a toilet bowl in a pool of my own chunder, for example. All this time, these little pockets of time would just appear in my periphery and sort of creep up on me like, like an old woman at the pharmacy waiting for her prescription, you know, just, <laughs> just... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> just her stilted breath whistling through her nostrils, just... <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Rolling a powdery mint around in her mouth. <laughs> Desperate to tell me about her new wart cream. Oh, look at the, my warty hands and face. <laughs> she hurt me in the skin. Uh, time for me had become a creepy old Italian woman. So <laughs> I decided to fill that time up by doing some stuff. And uh, I started off with a bit of self-development because, you know, I wasn't feeling the best about myself. Ow. <laughs> so I thought I'd do a bit of self-development and um, self-improvement. I guess just self-improvement get myself away from being a manic depressive bumbalati and get my shit back on track. So I, um, I started out with my diet. Now, I was already a vegetarian. Um, any vegetarians in? Yeah. That's a pretty re enthusiastic response from the vegetarians. Anybody got an iron tablet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was already vegetarian, and uh, it's a common misconception that we're healthier, though, just because we're vegetarians. We're not. We still eat a lot of shit food, just not the corpsey bits. So <laughs> I am. Um, and all the, actually, while we're on the fucking subject, vegetarians, were you guys at the meeting where eggplant became meat for vegetarians? <laughs> If anybody runs a restaurant or a cafe or some kind of street side diner, mm, mm, get this in your little noggin. No! No, Mediterranean vegetables, a vegetarian meal constitutes does not. That was a good sentence, wasn't it? <laughs> Don't! Just stop it! It's a tricky vegetable eggplant, you know? You've got to take care with that shit. You've got to salt it and soak it. <laughs> Leave it out for the next full moon and run over it with your car. <laughs> you can't just whack it in a soggy focaccia and hope for the best. It, takes, it tastes like mucus-covered bicycle tyres. <laughs> Stop it! I mostly became a vegetarian so I could get my food first on the plane, though. That is awesome. <laughs> Sitting next to someone who's really hungry and you get yours like 20 minutes, you've finished it, just kick it back with a movie and then... Mm! <laughs> I'm hungry! Yeah, well, fuck you. Anyway. So, um, but, oh, actually, planes, good. Thanks for bringing that up, Rosa, planes. Because anybody ever woken up hungover before the plane has landed? Oh, how fucked is that? You just sleep, smash it, and then fall asleep, and then wake up, and you're still in the air! 30,000 feet in a tin can, and you're all hunched and dehydrated, and your head's pounding like the fat guy next to you's been fucking you in the ear while you slept. <laughs> and you can't get anything you need. You just need a big bag of greasy hot chips and a lay down in a park somewhere with a cool breeze on your pasty face. But all you've had to eat is this microwaved slop that's laced with modium so that everybody doesn't shit at once. <laughs> you know they do that? They do that! They lace aeroplane food with modium to make everybody constipated so that 500 people don't simultaneously back one out at altitude. <laughs> it makes sense when you think about it. Not a big septic tank full of turds slopping around. Bit of turbulence doing the drink service. <laughs> Rivers of shit down the earth. And that's why you always feel the need to pass a rock melon in transit. <laughs> There's my passport. <laughs> Vegetarianism. It is hard being a vegetarian. It is hard because uh, on the road, sometimes it's difficult to be a vegetarian because 
You know, in the UK, for example, they still eat pig's blood for breakfast. <laughs> it's fucked up, man. <laughs> Black pudding, it's pig's blood. Huh? <laughs> and while we're on the subject, haggis. <laughs> Everybody know what haggis is? It's effectively like sheep's organs with some grains mixed in. Not good. <laughs> Not good. I was at a cafe in Edinburgh and a, a, the waitress came over and I said, I'll have the vegetarian breakfast, thanks, but I don't want the haggis. <gasps> <laughs> you don't want the haggis? <laughs> but that's vegetarian haggis. Tastes just like real haggis. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> Does it really taste just like the heart, liver and lungs of a sheep stuffed into its own stomach bag and then boiled for three hours? Because if that's the case, then hook me the fuck up. <laughs> Finally a vegetarian option I can stomach. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Was that just a delayed laugh? <laughs> or did something else happen in the room? I can't tell. If someone trips over and you guys all laugh at it or something, you've got to tell me. I won't, no. And if I ask any questions, don't put your hands up. <laughs> Not going to get us anywhere. I was, this is the, I'm sorry, I've got my vegetarian breakfast and the guy at the table next to me leans over and goes, you think that's bad about the haggis, man? I heard what you're saying. You think that's bad? You should try a flying Scotsman. This is actually a real thing. Has anybody heard of a flying Scotsman? No. Okay. It's where you take a chicken. Mm. Chicken. Chickity. And you stuff it with haggis. <laughs> and then you wrap it in bacon. And then you cook it and then you eat it and then you die. train of thought led to that culinary wrongness, just munching down on your sheep's offal. You know what would make this even more delicious? If it was inside a chicken's ass. Cut it out, Scotland. I used to be one of those vegetarians that ate fish but didn't tell anyone about it. Total fish and chipocrit. It's never, it's never a good look, is it? Just guiltily hoeing down on a piece of battered flake in the front seat of my car, like a fat, hairy porn star from the 70s, performing cunnilingus on his equally hirsute co-star. Don't look at me! image. Powerful image. I've got to say, when I do my live shows, I never use a monitor or anything. I just, I just, it's much more fun to just hear the audience and talk to people and stuff. But because it's the tally, when I do stuff on the tally, sometimes I have a little screen and I just, the, the screen's sort of been on and off for the show, but it was just on then and I talked about the and it was a beautiful crowd shot with everyone sort of laughing and then just one girl sitting there fucking hating it. <laughs> Just going. <laughs> and then at the end of the bit, her boyfriend went <laughs> and turned to her and went. <laughs> <laughs> so I got healthy. I started eating well. You know, I got really obsessed with my diet actually when I quit drinking, like massively obsessed. I started eating, like for breakfast, I would have these blueberry and spirulina smoothies with maca powder and goji berries and bee pollen and hemp seed and mix it all up, sort of grey ground brownie kind of blue swamp juice with the consistency of a newborn baby's feces, just <laughs> And then during the day I'd snack on anything particularly pretentious that I could get my hands on, like curly kale or hairy yams. <laughs> Anybody ever had a hairy yam? Once you've had a hairy yam, you'll never go back to the smooth ones. <laughs> hairy yam for life! 
And then at dinner, I'd eat anything dairy-free, cruelty-free, wheat-free, gluten-free, whole food, Himalayan pink, rock salt, save the whales, get a dragonfly tattoo, and hitchhike to Rainbow Serpent. <laughs> kind of food, just munch that in. And then for dessert, I'd have a tiny scoop of decaffeinated green tea ice cream and gallop off into the carbon-neutral sunset on my free-range high horse. <laughs> I'm better than you! <laughs> <laughs> Particularly sick sounding horse today, I'm not sure. <laughs> Hello, Larry. Are you all right? <laughs> I've never spoken to the horse before. I don't know why I did that. Um, so, yeah, while I was on my high horse up there, I also quit smoking. I thought I'd give the ciggies away. Just got rid of the ciggies. And um, it was a difficult thing to do, you know, getting up with the ciggies. But now that I've quit, they look really weird. <laughs> if you've ever quit, anyone ever quit the ciggies? Yeah. Do they look weird to you now, people that smoke? Yeah. Isn't it a weird habit? It doesn't make any sense. Like, if you've never seen it before, you're just like, oh. Oh. Wow, what? What are you doing? What's, <laughs> what's that? Well, this, <laughs> this is a cigarette. <laughs> what does it do? Tell me what it does. Tell me about that magical thing in my ear hole, out of your mouth face. What does it do? Well, <clears throat> you inhale the poisonous vapors from this end like so. Shut up. <laughs> and uh, it goes into your lungs and into your brain and into your blood system and stuff. And then, oh, this is the best bit. <sighs> you blow some of that shit back out. Sort of kills you slowly. You're a fucker! Yeah. <laughs> and scene. <laughs> Don't clap it! Don't clap it! <laughs> hey, I've noticed <laughs> there's a little bit of fluff sticking out of the back of my head. When I turn my head, I can see uh, <laughs> like a hair. They're gone. <laughs> Maybe it's just the angle. I can see it in the light. Nobody cares. The next 20 minutes of the show is just me grooming my purple noggin. <laughs> Settle in! Woo! <laughs> Did you go and see that dude that just rubbed his head for 20 minutes? <laughs> God, he's good, isn't he? Stamina. <clears throat> My point is that smoking is quite an odd thing to do. <laughs> but I actually, I, I, went the, I went the whole nine yards. I quit smoking and drinking on the same day which was fucking stupid in itself. But it also <laughs> happened to coincide with my girlfriend at the time moving into state. And we decided to embark upon a long distance relationship. All on the same day. <laughs> Smoking, drinking, fucking, off the list! <laughs> I recall being slightly tense, <laughs> a little bit pent up, so I started exercising. I started off by pulling on bits of rods attached to chains with weights on the end of them until my sphincter introduced itself to the back of my kneecaps. <laughs> and I decided to give Pilates a shot instead. Four weeks of Pilates, 
five weeks of Pilates, seven weeks, four months of Pilates later, three classes a week, and even my perineum now has a six pack. <laughs> Rosie, you know what a perineum is? <laughs> You want to tell us? I, I just sent some people in the room might know what a perineum is. I'm wondering if you'll help us out. <laughs> Say what? That's underage people in here. Under, well, good. Randy is sober is now also educational as well as entertaining. <laughs> Would somebody care to enlighten Rosa as to what a perineum is? <laughs> They're all grown up apart from the front row, apparently. <laughs> Anyone? The area between the anus and the scrotum. Correct! <laughs> or the equivalent on a woman. Everybody's got one. I don't normally stop and explain it. <laughs> but there was a ripple of... <laughs> I think that's, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> if you don't know, go home, sit on a mirror, explore it, enjoy it. <laughs> huh? We've all got one. Just if you've got a partner, go home, blah, 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 give it a bit of a ch check it out. If you leave this show with one thing, my friends, leave with your perineums. <laughs> Fucking hell. When I got healthy, I also uh, got rid of my car and got a bicycle and I immediately became that obnoxious guy on the bike. Just... <laughs> that's more of a run, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> just, just deliberately getting in front of cars so I could pull up next to them at traffic lights and go, Hey! I'm on a bike, you dickhead! <laughs> I will say this, though. In all of my bicycle wankery, I never once resorted to the use of lycra in any shape or form. <laughs> Be glad to know that you've seen these bastards, these businessmen that trade their suits for testicle-clutching fluoro fabric. <laughs> And you can smell them hurtling towards you from the suburbs like sweaty wasps with stingers of self-indulgence. Can anyone tell me? Can anyone shed some light on this to me? What, what, what is the dynamic reduction produced due to the existence of leg hair? Like in relation to distance travelled versus speed, is, is, is the hair on the leg, like, is it necessary to remove the hair from the waist down? Is it really slowing you down that much? <laughs> you ever seen this, these cyclists that shave their legs? Yeah. Fuck, it'd be a lot funnier if more than three of you had seen it. <laughs> a lot of cyclists shave their legs. Cyclists, a lot of cyclists shave their legs. It's just true. It's true. It happens. I don't understand. I, I actually, I was talking to, I did this once. I talked to a crowd about this once and a guy came up to me afterwards and said, I shave my legs because it's when I fall off, if I cut my legs, it hurts more with the hair, and then when it grows back, they have to put band-aids on. <laughs> sore on my legs. And when I, when I, just don't fall off your bike, you fuckhead. <laughs> Learn how to ride that sucker. <laughs> and then I saw him after the show, and he, <laughs> massive beard. <laughs> massive, don't you think that you'd shave that off first? Just, mm, hoo Oh, my legs are fine, but my face is caning! It hurt when that shit grows back. If you're hooking around an aerodrome with, you know, 15 other cyclists, go nuts, shave your legs, it's your job. But if you are removing the hair from your legs in direct correlation to riding your bicycle to work in the morning, you're a fucking cockhead. <laughs> I'm just a bit bitter. My ex-wife's new de facto is a fiend for lycra. He's a massive knob jockey. Grant. Grant. His name is Grant. He's a photographer. Actually, to, oh, this is going to come back and bite me talking about this, but to his credit, <laughs> in a roundabout sort of way, to his credit, Grant is actually the reason that I do comedy. It's true. See, uh... <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about this, but fuck it. Oh, my, my ex-wife, Polly, or as I prefer to call her, the woman that hates me. She's the editor of this hip fashion, skateboarding, parkour, pirate folk, textile exhibiting, make do and men graphic design magazine called... Yeah, it's called... 
It's a kind of magazine you may find strewn on the coffee table of some coke-riddled young architect, flanked by an entourage of exotic women with their high-split cocktail dresses offering a cheeky glint of labial piercing as they <laughs> casually leaf through the pages of... So Polly was working with this Grant fucker on a few fashion shoots back when her and I were still together. This is like 10 years ago now, and I was out of work at the time, and Grant was taking stills on this feature film that was beginning production in Sydney, and somehow he managed to hook me up with a job as a driver. Weird job, being a driver. I was very grateful until he started banging my wife, but, you know... <laughs> Story for another time, Rosa! <laughs> the, film, <laughs> the film was called Mechanicorosity. It was a sci-fi pomo vampire thriller set in post-apocalyptic Florida. Stupidest job I have ever had. Every morning I would pick up Keanu Reeves at his hotel and then drive him to set. And then I'd usually spend the remainder of the day smoking ciggies with the girls in the production office and honing my skills as lord and master of the cryptic crossword. And then when Keanu was done reinventing the meaning of the word stilted for the cameras, I'd give him a lift back to his hotel. I will say this about Keanu Reeves. He may not be a very good actor, <laughs> but he's a cunt. <laughs> so when production wrapped on that film, uh, I'd made a couple of mates and they took me on to the next job and the next job after that. And before I knew it, I worked in the film industry. It was cool. But I look back on those years and I don't really remember much, though, and I think it's because nothing bad happened. Is that weird? I think things with Polly and I were good and I was earning decent cash and I just sort of bobbed along in the current for a while. Just bobbing it. <laughs> bobbing away. I don't think I ever really remember the shit bits. Before I quit drinking, I think I only really made an effort to exist in the gaps. You know, only sort of paying attention during periods of transition while stuck between worlds. Hence my tendency to be blissfully unaware of things falling to shit around me until it had already happened. Then I was all over it. Then I'd happily lay back and make little poo angels in the shit <laughs> for as long as it took to rebalance the universe. Just, no! Woo! Poo angels! Yeah! Then I'd just clamber back into the bottle, reseal the cork and fucking roll back into the current. <laughs> just bobbing along, awaiting the next jagged rock to remind me that in order to qualify as living, you have to occasionally engage in the world around you. <laughs> I told you I shouldn't have fucking started talking about that. <laughs> Why did I start talking about it? Oh, comedy! How I got into comedy! So I got... <laughs> Grant! So I got a job as a third assistant director on this children's television series called Mr. Wumpy and the Dimple Town Dancy Monkeys. <laughs> My job, it was another fucking stupid job. My job consisted primarily of organising a large group of six-year-old children to sing along and dance about the place while Mr. Wumpy and his Dimple Town Dancy Monkeys cranked out their impressive back catalogue of songs in the key of Wiggle. <laughs> the kids, man, these kids, they were usually pinging off their tiny noggins on sugary treats they'd been wolfing down in the green room. They fed these kids sugar. They came in and then they just went, oh, here, have a shitload of lollies! And then gave them to me to look after. <laughs> <laughs> it was insane! I spent the first few weeks on that job tearing my hair out because I had no idea how to control the little bastards. Seriously, I was coming home every night after work and passing out face first on the bed like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> They're horrible. They're horrible. So I started to come up with different ways of entertaining them, you know, keeping them focused between takes and stopping them from eating each other's snot on camera. <laughs> we do stuff like play games and, you know, sing songs. And as a result, I left that job with a hefty backlog of party tricks, including the innate ability to pick a soiled undergarment at 50 paces. <laughs> that shit comes in handy. So when the work dried up in the film industry, it was like a natural albeit slightly desperate decision to start doing children's party. Yeah. Mm. It's funny because it's true. 
<laughs> Before I got into comedy, I hosted children's parties. And at the last, <laughs> I still shouldn't be talking about this. At the last party, <laughs> the last party I ever did, I vomited the previous night's tequila uh, into the face of a six-year-old girl. Yeah, it was her party. I was, <laughs> oh God. And it was one of those chunders that just sneaks up on you and just sort of plops out at an involuntary torrent, just sort of. She No, she'd won this little plastic necklace out of a piñata and she asked me to help her put it on and she was facing me and I was like reaching around her neck to do up the class and I just went Bleh! just like Bleh! oh, I went in her little mouth that was so fucked. She was like, ah! And then it was one of those vomits that just totally debilitates you. Like you can't talk, you can't, you can't do anything, it just goes for ages. You're just like Bleh! Uh! Bleh! Sorry. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Last party I ever did. So I I was telling that story to a comedian friend of mine and he said that's very funny. You should do that on stage. So I did. It wasn't a roaring success by any means, but but uh, I got a lot of free booze out of it, so I kept doing it. <laughs> and that was about seven years ago. And now look at me, huh? all happy and healthy, doing the Pilates and getting the massage. So thank you, Grant. <laughs> I do actually get regular massages when I can, when, I, when, I, when I'm about the place on the road and stuff for my little scrotal neck. I like a massage. <laughs> and, but it can be a bit hit and miss when you're touring massages, because sometimes, I was in Canberra, and uh, I saw her, I saw her, did you hear that? I was in Canberra. <laughs> I take it, I'm a very heavy guy. I was in Canberra. Oh, trampoline. stuck in the springs. <laughs> I was in Canberra and I went for a massage. I saw this uh, advertisement in a shop window and, uh, and it was like for a guy for a massage. And I, I, was, it was like, I was only there for a day. So I called him and said, oh, dude, can you fit me in? He goes, oh, I'm about to close. I'm like, I'm only here for a day. And he goes, all right, I'll stay open. I'll stay open. <laughs> Made a big deal out of it. So I rocked up at his house and uh, it was at his house. And um, it was like a little gate and I went through. This bit of the story is not interesting. I don't know what I'm telling you, but this is how I got there. And I went in, and the first thing that struck me about this dude was his amazing skin condition, I guess you'd call it, which resulted in him having these little red, crusty scabs on his face and hands! Now, normally I just say, oh shit, I didn't realize you had the plague, and fucking run. <laughs> But he'd stayed open, he'd stayed open, and I felt really bad, so I found myself stripped down to my underpants, laying there, just tensing every muscle in my body while he exfoliated me with his crusty hand lesions. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> and I asked him how long he'd been doing massage, and he said, eight years. Don't you think in all that time someone would have taken him aside and gone, dude, massage? Really? Why not more the lesions? <laughs> or the person who trained him. If I ran a school of natural therapies and a guy rocked up on enrolment day with his face falling off like potato crisps, <laughs> I'd think about giving him some alternate career advice. Um, or you could be an apiarist. <laughs> What's that? It's a beekeeper. You wear a mask, some gloves. No, no, no. Uh, you could... But competition fencing? Competition fencing? No, no. Uh. 
Oh, here's one. You could be king of the lepers. I also, when I quit drinking, I also started doing some extensive research into internet pornography. <laughs> and yeah, you can tell we've really hit the, uh, the highbrow end of the show in the middle. Just chuck all the fucked up shit in the middle. They'll love it. So, no, no, this isn't fucked up. I, yeah. I started researching internet pornography and I found that the porn of the 60s and 70s, you know, it, it looked like fun. You know, there's a lot of, lot of hairy nuns and curious secretaries and <laughs> Benny Hill chase music and everyone was kind of smiling and yeah, woo, 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 woo. But now it's really violent and it's yucky and the, particularly the stuff that comes out of the States, like there's a lot of fake tans and fake tits and the guys are just assholes. You can tell they're massive jerks. There's a lot of Viagra use and they're just and it's quite violent and not in a particularly sexy way and it's just... You know, it's yucky. A lot of choking and spitting and bleh. It's just, it's horrible. And I think we're teaching a generation of young masturbators to, you know, to disrespect that and what that should be, what that c coming together of two people should actually be from whatever kind of sexual preference, whatever, you, whatever you're into. I'm not, you know, whatever you want to do. But it's just, it's weird, man. And it makes me feel, makes my skin crawl and I just feel yucky. I just have to switch it off as soon as I've ejaculated. I'm like, no! <laughs> Get it away! <laughs> it's an ongoing process, self-development. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You know, when I quit drinking, I thought I would have this massive epiphany where I would suddenly see all my faults laid bare and, and by some miracle I'd just have all the tools to suddenly correct all of them, you know. And, and while I was having this ma massive epiphany, the, the song Teardrop by Massive Attack would just start playing gently in the background and I'd be going, oh, that's what it's about. And love, love is a verb, love is a do not fear lest I must bury a head. None of that. I just wank more often now. <laughs> My friends, I think this is a good enough time, a good a time as any. I think it's time to talk about Jesus. Now, <laughs> I was raised Catholic. I was brought up Catholic. Any other Catholics in the house? Yeah. Yeah, any lapsed Catholics? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm lapsed. I'm lapsed. <laughs> I'm, yeah, you still guilty about it? No. No, no you're not? I fucking am. <laughs> it's weird, man. The God of my childhood was essentially a creepy old man sitting on a cloud leering at me every time I thought about doing a wee. It's pretty fucked up shit to tell your kids. There's a big scary man on a cloud in the sky and he can see and hear everything you do and say. And if you do something wrong, he'll send you down to hell where your skin will be flayed off and you'll be flogged and tortured by vampire monsters that'll fuck you in the ass with flaming jackhammers. <laughs> so don't you eat any of those biscuits before dinner. <laughs> Slightly paranoid childhood. <laughs> but the more I read as I grew, I kind of evolved past that idea. You know, I read a lot of stuff. I read about different religions, I read about Buddhism, I read Richard Dawkins, I read Stephen Hawking. My God, that man blows me away. When I was 15, I read A Brief History of Time and it blew my tiny purple mind, man. That book is amazing. Everything that man says in, is like fucking incredible. The polarity of a black hole and encountering similarity <laughs> in space time continuum when talking about white hole mechanics and the black hole of the. I don't know if that's fucked up or not. I don't know. I still can't tell. People kind of laugh, but they sound like they don't really want to laugh. <laughs> white hole mechanics. And the... Oh, look, what's that over there? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I read a lot of that stuff. It was good. It was good. And I kind of became what I guess you would call a pragmatic agnostic. Like, I don't believe in God, but because I still have the image of eternal damnation in the back of my head, if he turns up one day, I'll probably buy him a drink. <laughs> but I've been thinking about all this stuff, um, and uh, I went to a church. I was thinking about this stuff. It was sort of on my mind, and it was sort of coming back up. Because when you do quit drinking or quit any sort of addiction, you know, or whatever. Maybe this was just me anyway. All this sort of stuff started to come back up. Childhood memories just sort of float up to the surface. Ooh, trampoline. No, fuck that. <laughs> and, um, 
and I started to think about it all. So I went to a church to, you know, think about it. And I sat down and I was struck with a sense of <sighs> sanctuary, I guess you'd call it. Like actual sanctuary. Like the church used to be, you know. Until about 400 years ago, if you were being, if you were in some sort of strife, you know, and you wanted to get away, you could just go into a church and you'd be safe. That's what it was. If you were being chased by a rabid Viking on a donkey with a big axe that just wanted to hurt you in the face and legs, you could just go into a church and you'd be safe. You're just hanging out the window going, Whoa, I'm in the church. Ah, suck a dick. Ah, I'm Barley's. The church is Barley's. I fucking love Barley's. Does everyone know what Barley's is? Yeah, when you're playing Chasey or Tiggy or whatever and there's an area that you can't get tigged or tagged or whatever. You're Barley's. I'm Barley's. Ah, Barley's. Why Barley? Why not Phuket? Why not, why not CM Reef? I'm Ho Chi Minh. Get back, I'm Ho Chi Minh. I'm Jakarta. I'm Jakarta. Get back, you can't get me, I'm Jakarta. No, Randy, Bali is a childish colloquialism derived from the word parlay, which is when two opposing parties hold a discussion whilst under a truce. Wow. Thank you, linguistic heckler. Linguistic heckler, word-related heckles. <laughs> but I understood it for the first time, I think, that sense of sanctuary. And I sat there in the church and I felt calm and I felt peaceful and I was filled with this kind of, I don't know, sense of contentment, I guess you'd call it. And I looked around and, and, and there was a priest that's lighting a candle and the smell of the candle smoke and just invoked these kind of childhood memories and, and the wooden pews and the stations of the cross and, and, and the stained glass windows, and it all sort of culminated, and I felt really good. For the first time in ages, I felt in my skin, I felt, I felt good, I felt happy, you know? And I got up, and I walked back down the aisle, just filled with this sense of happiness. It's just what it is, it's just happiness, you know? And I thought, I could do this. I could come here every week. I could, I, could, I could find my God again. And just as I was about to dip my fingers in the holy water at the entrance and make the sign of the cross for the first time in almost 20 years and walk out into the sunshine, a changed man, I looked across and I saw a whole wall of anti-abortion literature and I went, fuck! <laughs> so that was the end of that. <laughs> I do love religious debate, though. I do, because there's never any winner. You know, it, you very rarely change someone's faith just by having a conversation with them. It just doesn't happen. It's like a snake munching on its own tail. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> I'm going in a circle. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> and historically, you know, if you wanted to get into it, if you wanted to have some kind of religious debate, you know, you had to study for decades and wait your turn sitting outside a dusty temple somewhere to lock horns with the theological titans of the time. It was heavy shit, man. <laughs> now, as far as I can see, the contemporary method of engaging in some sort of a religious powwow is to find a YouTube clip, <laughs> preferably with 20,000 views or more, something popular like a cat playing a glockenspiel, for example. <laughs> And then you just scroll down to the comments page and you go something like, um, uh, if Jesus saw a cat playing a glockenspiel, he'd shoot it in the head because its owner is a faggot. And away you go! <laughs> Debate on! My God is better than your God. Discuss. <laughs> These people just going each other in the YouTube. It's amazing. Cat playing a glockenspiel. Muhammad was a child raping mass murderer. OMG, I can't believe you hate a fucking ruffle. God hates you. You will burn. Lol. <laughs> this is what we've got for the next wave of human evolution. This is how we discuss this shit now. And it's going into space. <laughs> Does that not terrify anyone else? 
There are currently lizard creatures sitting on a distant planet, <laughs> looking down at us, deciding whether or not to use us as target practice. They currently don't have a lot of evidence to suggest we're worth keeping around. <laughs> what are you watching, Grimslaw? <laughs> I'm watching the humans become stupider. <laughs> There's humans on Jupiter? <laughs> no. I said I was watching the humans become stupider. Oh, stupider! Yes. I thought you said Jupiter. <laughs> no. <laughs> what, a, what a silly misunderstanding! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Humans, you say? Yes. Shall we drink their blood? Yes. It's going into space. It's going into space. I don't know. I don't want an iPad. This is this thing. Everybody's got all these little things, all these little things where they're shooting the shit into space. I was on the plane shooting the shit. And it's going into space. That's actually what you can't see. When you're looking at your iPhone or your iPad, there's like... <laughs> All the shit flying out of it, going... Mm. Goes into your head. Mm. Mm. Look, it's the puppet rubbing his head again. Mm. You know? I was on the plane and there was a dude there trying to sell me an iPad. On the plane, huh? Oh, look at this. Huh? You know that? I'm reading a book on a little screen. <laughs> I bet you want to read a book on a little screen. No! It's how robots read books. <laughs> I'll stick with my crisp, bound, papery paperback with its amazing paperback smell. Thank you. But there's thousands of titles at my fingertips. It's called a bookstore. It's called a library. Get out. Engage with your fellow man. <laughs> Fuck that, I'm not standing in a queue. Oh no, but you wait for five nights in the rain for that, you fucking... <laughs> he actually said, he actually said, I'm not standing in a queue. Cue rage is my favourite thing in the whole world. I cannot, there is nothing funnier than someone in a queue losing their shit. Because there's nothing you can do. You just stand there, wait your turn, or just fuck off out of the queue. Standing there going, yeah! <laughs> it doesn't do anything. I was in the supermarket the other day. I saw the best fucking cure rage ever, right? There's me, there's a guy in front of me, and you know how now in the supermarket you can boop your own shit? <laughs> they, 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 they let you do your own boop. You just go in and go boop. I get to do my own fucking boop. They can do that. So I'm there, there's me, there's, 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 there's him. Oh, he's in front of me, I'm behind him, and then there's four people, right, four... Four people who, by some fucking comedy miracle, had all never booked their own shit before. <laughs> so we're standing there, and then there's just these four people all simultaneously just going. to try and absorb me into his bubble of hatred. Can you fucking believe this shit? Like it's the greatest injustice he's ever encountered. Like the Oxfam truck ran out of rice just before he got his scoop full. <laughs> oh, now my village will have no food. Supermarket queue, your ball sack, relax. <laughs> I got very distracted. I wanted to talk about Jesus. <laughs> He's been like four hours long. He's just going, what else can I? And another thing. <laughs> Jesus. I think he's probably been misrepresented in the Bible, Jesus. You know? He's probably a pretty good guy. But, you know, I think, it, I think the Bible, yeah, may, he may have been misrepresented. Because the Bible was written by his fans. <laughs> the Bible is essentially fan fiction. <laughs> 
ever read any fan fiction? The main character's always in weird situations they were never in in the original series. It's always a bit sideways. You know, Jesus sitting on a cloud, reading it, going, walking on water? I was in a dinghy. <laughs> Dad, they left out the dinghy. Did they, son? <laughs> uh, dinghy. Fuck off, Dad. Go to your cloud. <laughs> I don't know. I just think, you know, like a couple of thousand years ago, even a thousand years ago, when we didn't have any other explanation for shit, I can understand why people put all their faith into that. You know, because everything was because of God. Fucking anything that happened, like, you know, like, oh, lightning, run! We have angered the gods! Run from the anger of the gods! Quick, someone kill a virgin! <laughs> but now it's like, oh! Lightning! An electrostatic discharge in the troposphere caused by an accumulation of charged solar particles. Quick, someone pass me a sandwich. <laughs> We've got the number on most natural phenomena. Phenomena. <laughs> phenomena. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We do. We've got, we've got answers for things now. You know, we've got the polarity of a black hole and, uh, and stuff. We know stuff now. I suppose it's not that big a deal, really, is it? At the end of all of that ranting. <laughs> Whether I drink or not, I mean. <laughs> the title of the show, we may as well get back on topic. <laughs> Everybody's got their cross to bear. Mine just happens to be in the shape of a tequila bottle and has a tendency to make me think that doing the nut bush is a nifty concept. <laughs> but, you know, as far as global perspective is concerned, the matter of whether or not I pour myself another Savignon Blanc pales in comparison to the reality faced by a few billion other members of the species. In theory, it should be entirely possible for anyone at all to rise above that kind of shit with little to no impact on the rest of humanity. Just slowly removing oneself like a finger from a glass of gin and tonic. <laughs> Suddenly getting a bit heavy, isn't it? <laughs> Go back to being funny, you little purple bastard! <laughs> I suppose that's what happens when you take off the beer goggles. The scantily clad seductress of blissful ignorance reveals herself as a gnarled she-witch with liver-spotted breasts and a cadaverous vulva, just <laughs> dry-humping an open wound on your leg as you lay paralysed on a sweaty vinyl beanbag. <laughs> yeah? You with me on that imagery? <laughs> I mean, we're all ultimately capable of mastering the art of self-discipline. Fuck knows, plenty of people in this room probably have more self-discipline in their elbow skin than I do in my entire little felty body. But for some reason, when it comes to drinking, the grooves of age-old excuses run so deep and they're so slippery, it's almost impossible to clamber out of them for long enough to see that there are very few reasons to drink at all, really. To drink to smoke, to believe in God, to, 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 to not believe in God, to eat meat, to not eat meat, to jerk off watching strangers having sex, to learn about the perineum, you know, <laughs> to be in constant, desperate communication with everyone you know at all times. What is with that? I'm in a show. Oh, I'm in a show too. Oh, I'll fucking tweet about it. You fucking... <laughs> I don't want to sound like a curmudgeon old bastard, but it sort of just creeps up on you, you know? Just, just, just this need to be witnessed and eager to consume the next distraction until the distractions themselves become the pursuit. When did that happen? When did the distraction become the pursuit? Actually, no, I'll tell you when it happened. Fucking Gavin and his fucking fig. <laughs> Selfish caveman bastard. Forever doomed humankind to be defined by its indulgences. What a prick. That's what I should have called the show. Gavin the fig-eating prick in the fig of doom. <laughs> Speaking of which, this is pretty much where the show ends. Yeah? Yeah? Aww. Aww. 
I could scream at you for another four hours. <laughs> I'm sure you're all keen to get to the bar. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I'll be there with you, lemonade in hand, surreptitiously glancing over your shoulder at the wall of glistening bottles with all their potential glory and ruin. Just thinking to myself, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Good night, thank you!